He wrote a book called Sectarian Milieu, or Quranic Studies. And these particular people make detailed, incisive analysis of the text, and they confirm that what you've got here is no different. The Muslim that you've got, the Quran that you've got here, is the same Quran recited and promulgated during the time of the Prophet, during the time of the Khulafah Rashidi. So I think, Alistair, you're making a big mark of a mole here by suggesting, well, the Quran burnt. What are you trying to suggest? He burnt the Quran, so the Quran is false. Is that what you're suggesting? Say it if you want to say it, but don't come up with assumptions when you can't back up the assumptions and then you have to invent fictitious stories which I can pick up um, from fictitious bookshops and I can make my orders if I want to. Question now to Pastor Glendon. The people of Moses teach their own healing, believe in magic. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to stick into a snake. The people of Jesus teach their own belief in magic. So Allah sends Jesus peace be upon him with the miracle of cure. Could it be that why Jesus peace be upon him is, is mistaken to be God? How does a miracle make a human be God? How does a miracle make a human be God? I'm going to answer that question in the following manner. How was man created? We both tonight believe that man was formed out of the dust of the ground. One of the ways that Jesus proved that he was God was through a miracle. And what did he do? He created eyesight through spitting in the ground and putting the sand and the spittle that he had mixed into a blind man's eyes and the blind man proceeds. One of the ways that to prove that Jesus is God. No man since then, or before that, could create any human part out of the dust of the ground. I believe tonight in my whole heart that Jesus is God. Um, why? Because the speaker said just now, he said, uh, Jesus can be said, I am. Because one of the names of Jesus is I am. And the I am is the name that is used of the creator of God in the Old Testament. So in answer to this question, I will say to you tonight that um, uh, the, the people of Jesus believed in medicine. Today we still believe in medicine. And, uh, and Luke was a doctor. So I believe that when people uh, say that they are healed, um, the proof must be made. And if there's no proof, don't stop taking the medicine. Take the medicine. So that it's all part and parcel of the magic is not of God. Uh, in, in the context where uh, they call it demonic spirits, uh, it is not uh, of God. And I've had a lot of experience of that when we go into houses with the demonic problems, uh, and people call it all sorts of help. And the answer is in calling on Jesus, you see, uh, the, the Bible teaches us that Jesus has a name that is about every other name. And how we clean houses out is we enforce that Jesus is Lord. Thank you, Pastor. Question now for Yusuf Ismail, please. Who was the stone? Which stone? The stone that was um, in front of the tomb, which Jesus was there. Yeah, look, that, that was basically uh, the subject. When Mary comes up, we are told that she comes to the tomb at, at the last, um, the post-crucifixion appearance of Jesus. And what happens is that she finds the stone apparently removed. Now, this has raised a number of issues therefore for Christian scholars for centuries, is that if the stone was indeed, if Jesus was indeed, he had died and he was resurrected, what was the need for the stone itself to be removed? In other words, which was guarding this tabernacle, the tabernacle, I wouldn't say it's like a, a roomy chamber which was created by Joseph of Arimathea, which had a spacious quarters. According to Jim Bishop, it has certain diameters and measurements in terms of how long it was, how large it was, how lengthy it was. And this begs the question that if Jesus had been resurrected, if he had died, if he had basically was going to be ascended, as a spirit, there would be no need for the stone to be removed. Because stone walls
Do not keep someone in prison. It is spiritualized. The only need for the stone to be removed is if a person needs to survive. He needs air. He needs food. He needs shelter, etc. And the, this, this answer has been questioned, questioned and answered by an individual called Frank Morrison, who is a biblical scholar who wrote, writing in the 40s and writing in the 50s. And he came to the conclusion that it was a secret disciples of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, that indeed moved the stone away from the actual place that it was and effectively allowed Jesus to in fact recuperate. You see, all of this deals with the post-crucifixion appearances of Jesus. And if you analyze the post-crucifixion appearance of Jesus, there's a number of issues that we have. Firstly, why is it, or how does one explain the fact that his disciples could not identify him? Why was he constantly in the state of disguise? Why is it that one woman, one woman, Mary, could basically, was not afraid when she saw Jesus, but she rushed out to lunch and grabbed him, yet 12 men, or 10 men, or 11 men, as the story goes in the upper room, were terrified when Jesus appeared in the upper room. And so this begs the question that has led many scholars to come to the conclusion that perhaps what the people were viewing was not a resurrected Jesus, but a resuscitated Jesus. A Jesus who had basically survived the crucifixion. If you look in Luke 24 verse 36, when Jesus himself goes up to the other room and he says, Peace be unto you, we are told that the disciples were terrified and they were frightened because they thought that he was a spirit. Now the question is, did Jesus look like a spirit at that point in time? And the answer is no. So this begs the following question. Why then did the disciples of Jesus think that he was a spirit when he didn't look like him? Why? If someone dies, if any of us die, or you hear the news that we die, and the next morning we come knocking at your doors, and even though it's publicized the news, what would you think? You'd think you've seen a ghost. And so in the same way, these people thought they saw a ghost. And what does Jesus tell them? He says, look at my hands and my feet. You hold my hands and my feet. Now, why would Jesus say that? Why would he go out of his way to say, look at my hands and my feet? And he goes on to say, a spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have. What's he trying to emphasize when he says it? What's he trying to emphasize? Because Paul asks the question, how did they resurrect him? They saw him naturally and they resurrected spiritually. Now, in Jesus' case, if he had died, he would also be resurrected and his resurrection would be Yet he's going out of his way to suggest, I'm a man, flesh and bones. A spirit has no flesh and bones, as you see me have. And then we're told that they believe not for joy and wonder. What happened? And they asked, and then he asked them, have you anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and honeycomb. And they took it and he ate to prove what? That he's a spirit, that he's resurrected? No, to prove that he's alive, that he survived the crucifixion. And so coming back to the original issue, the person who moved the stone would be the person who put the stone in the first place. And that would be Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, the two secret disciples of Jesus when Jesus was most in need, and all these other disciples for secure and faith. These people were there at his most critical time. And they came, they met the assistance. Mary Magdalene was one of the other people that had witnessed what had happened at Golgotha. She was witness that Jesus had survived, and therefore when she saw him, she was not terrified. Twelve men or ten men were terrified because they were not eyewitnesses. They assumed he had died, and so when he appeared before them, they basically presume that he was a spirit. But he says a spirit has no flesh and bones. Thank you so much. Jesus' death, resurrection, coming out of the tomb. Before Jesus died and shed his blood, in the Old Testament, when people died, they went down if they were expecting the Messiah to come. Under the earth, there are three places. There's a place called hell. There's a place called, what's the place called paradise. And there's another place called the bottom spirit. And that's the holding place for demon spirits who in the, uh, what, is, what the Bible calls the tribulation period, the demon spirits will come out of the bottom spirit. So in the Old Testament, when people die, they went down, they went down, but they didn't go into hell if they were expecting that Jesus, the 
and a sign that was coming back if you were expecting the sign. And the people that were sinners in the Old Testament, they went down into a place called hell. And that's found in the book of Luke chapter 16. Why do I say that? What happened to those people that were in paradise? In the book of Matthew chapter 27, from verse 50, it says Jesus died and gave his last breath. And then it says, um, after, after Jesus, uh, Jesus rose from the dead, further down in verse 52 and verse 53, it says that the bodies of the saints who had died arose. The Old Testament saints, when Jesus arose, whether now who moved the stone, I don't know, young lady. All I do know is that when Jesus arose, he came, he arose after he went down to preach to the saints, to, to the saints down in hell. Says the book of Colossians and Ephesians. So Jesus arose and he took the Old Testament saints with him in the book of Matthew chapter 27. Thank you so much. I have a question concerning the Old Testament because the uh, pastor did mention that the Old Testament cannot be mentioned, that the New Testament cannot come without the Old Testament. So my question is based on the first book of Samuel, chapter 15, verse 35, which states, God instructed the Israelites, now go to Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have, and do not spare them, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. My question is, do you honestly believe that God Almighty the most merciful one would tell Moses or would tell the Israelites to kill the infants and the sucklings of the Amalekite children. That's what would God would God command that the little infants and sucklings be slaughtered and killed and wipe out everybody as in Deuteronomy 20, 16, which says, Leave alive nothing that my question is, how can God command the killing of an infant or a baby? Thank you, Mama. Thank you so much. Um, Amalek, um, the New Testament understanding of Amalek is that Amalek is a type of flesh. Now, the flesh is not the body. The flesh is that which, which causes us to crave after pornography or crave after opposite sex or uh, crave stealing or whatever uh, vices we have to Amalek was a type of flesh. Now, now Amalek, if you study the, the, the nation of Amalek, they were so wicked, they were offering up babies. And they had a god, I forget what the name of the, uh, the god was, but this god um, had, uh, they sort of had the god's hands, and what they would do at certain times of the year, they would take newborn babies and put the babies into the hands of this uh, statue. That they had created. And then, um, if the baby crawled off the hand and fell into a fire, that was the baby's problem. But the child that didn't move that was spared, I'm just taking you somewhere, that was spared, that became sort of a special child. In Amalek also, they used to have uh, statues of male penises that they would bow down to as their gods. And it was for this reason, the Old Testament is very clear. When after Joshua brought the nation of Israel into the promised land, there was time that God would say, go in and get hurt and kill everybody. And there's a reason for that. What it points to, the spiritual meaning of that, sir, is that um, in the New Testament, God says, if you, if you want to serve me, get rid of everything pertaining to the flesh. All sin, uh, sin must have no part of you. Be quick to forgive and uh, be quick. Uh, to ask God for forgiveness for his sins. But then what do you say about Psalms chapter 137 verse 9 where God says, uh, Happy is he, O daughter of, Dab of, of Babylon, O daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is he who repays you for what you have done to us. Happy is he who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. Uh, my question is based on, on, on the infant part, on the sufferings. Would God command the Israelites, or would God, God Almighty, the most merciful one? Why, why don't the Israelites adopt those kids if they're being murdered? Why must the Israelites go and kill all, all the little infants and sufferings? You know, and, and, and again, the daughter of Babylon, the people of Babylon, in, again, uh, happy if you dash your infants against the ground and against the rocks. 
Bible, where God commands that the people of Samaria also, they, their pregnant woman must be ripped open and, and their pregnant woman must be ripped open. So these are things that, uh, that I think, yeah. uh, I think we should be really addressing. I think it's a similar question uh, that must be answered when we say, uh, why would a loving God send people to hell? And uh, the next question would be, what about the person that's a murderer? Must they also be saved? And it is the same thing. God is a just God. As much as He's a loving God, He's also a God that will, will meet our vengeance and justice. And the same God is Can you justify the killing of a little infant? Can any righteous man justify the killing and murdering of little infants? That, that's the question. Yeah. Well, I will say that who's going to raise the child? The seed remains. The seed remains. And the child is, is, comes from the seed, or is the seed of the man. Who is the Amalekite? So you just kill them. You can't raise them, you just kill them. Not in the New Testament. That was Old Testament. Just a quick reply on that. What the brother was raising, the issue of the Amalekite massacre. This was something which Amalek, Amalek in fact, did 400 years prior. And we are told that I remember that which Amalek did to Israel 400 years ago. Now go and smite Amalek 400 years later. Now this basically contradicts the idea in Psalms chapter 100 verse 5 where we are told that God's mercy is everlasting. The difficulty we have with this is that do we at the end of the day define the Amalekite massacre as a moral atrocity? And many people are coming to the conclusion that if it did in fact take place, it was a moral atrocity. Not only that, the brother um, I think never dealt with the other issue of Numbers chapter 31 verse 17 where their commandment was given to Moses that they would kill all the men, women and children, particularly the woman that has not known man by lying with him, they had to take for themselves. And those that had obviously had engagements with other men, they would kill them. Now how does one discern these particular points and these particular facts? I think that sometimes it becomes disingenuous to justify them as being the works of God. I would rather take an honest position to suggest that these were works and products of history where people developed sometimes myths, sometimes incidences, sometimes certain perspectives which are not divinely inspired because God is one. And if Jesus is God, Jesus would be part of the triune Godhead. And by extension, Jesus himself would then be responsible for these massacres and these genocides and these atrocities. Thank you. So I would view them in history and in its particular historical context. Thank you. I have the last 15 minutes and I have five questions, little questions. I'm going to now ask, and they're all five directed to, to Pastor. The Quran is what he revelation or a real book. Is a Bible what he revelation or is it an inspired book and inspired by who? Um, the answer to that is the Bible, that's on your, on your bookshelf or that you could do it. That is known as the Logos. In other words, it's just like any other book. But the Bible, when um, you are reading it, and it does something for you, it changes your life. It then is not just the Logos, it becomes the reign of the world. In other words, it brings change or it blesses you. So uh, that answers that question. Yeah. Just a quick one on that. The difference is between revelation and inspiration. The Quran believe, we believe that the Quran was a direct revelation where God Himself dictates to the Prophet. For example, He says, Qul Ahad, say He is God the one and only. Or Iqraq Bismillah the Nifala, read in the name of that Lord. Inspiration, on the other hand, which the pastor believes in the New Testament is inspired, is where men write their own words and they were inspired or tickled by the Holy Spirit. But it's not a direct word for word revelation where God dictates to you. The problem with that is that you will, for example, find passages in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, where, for example, Paul would say, I wrote unto you in a previous epistle not to take company with fornicators, but now I tell unto you, do not do this. Now, the vexed question is, Paul speaks about a previous letter that he wrote, the previous letter to the Corinthians. Which was the first letter to the Corinthians? He says, concerning the virgins, I have no inspiration of the Lord. So here Paul is suggesting that he has no verbal inspiration. So again, if you look at the New Testament, you find that it's problematic to believe that each and every single verse is inspired. There are passages which 
turn on his Bible. And brother, if basically you want to hear the truth, I think you want to hear two sides. If you claim to be a Muslim, you want to hear two sides. Myself and the pastor. If you don't want to hear me, then obviously that's for the audience to make their final decision. People, that brings us to a conclusion of the, the question and answer session. To those people that wrote me little notes, I apologize that I was unable to read them all. It was not fair in my opinion to you guys that decided to write all these questions and you're not going to get answers this evening. And I apologize for that. I apologize to you as well. Uh, I believe, before I conclude the program, that there is a brother in the, in the auditorium that wants to give shahada.